beaming into creation's 56-year mission tour to Las Vegas. This is Trexone's 2022 Vegas or Bus Tour. On this edition, one of the driving forces behind Star Trek continues and so much more, Mr. James Kerwin. This is a Trexone conversation. Continuing Trexone's Vegas or Bust coverage today, I'm joined by Mr. James Kerwin. We've had him on the show in the past. Last year, uh, we had a deep dive into Star Trek Continues. James, been at the convention for a few days. What's it been like to uh, not only have a COVID interruptus, as I'm calling it, but also a new venue as well? Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I think uh, COVID hasn't really impacted it that much. Um, I, I feel like the biggest change has been the change in venue. We're at Bally's this year as opposed to the Rio or the Hilton before that. Bally's is different because there's the, the vendor's room is slightly smaller. Um, there's less distance between it and the other areas. However, the other panels are upstairs on the 26th floor. So um, I think the biggest uh, um, thing that's changed, the biggest thing that people have had to get used to uh, is using the elevators tra to traverse those 26th six floors to go between different panels. Uh, but I feel like after four days, people have gotten accustomed to it. Uh, so things seem to be running pretty smoothly. Nice. Is there a bit of a disconnect between those two floors being, you know, almost 25 flights apart? Yeah, it, well, the, there is one, the Leonard Nimoy Theatre, the main stage theatre, is down here by the vendor's room on the first floor, the ground floor. Uh, the other two rooms upstairs are the D. Kelly stage and the Roddenberry stage. It, um, and so it's a little quieter up there. Um, you have to it, you have to have intention to go up there to see a panel. You People aren't just wandering by and checking out what's there. So that is one disadvantage. But the, the panels that I've done up there, I've done two so far, they've been extremely well attended. Um, so they seem to be uh, they seem to be filling the rooms pretty well. Very, very cool. Now, speaking of that D. Kelly stage, you were on stage on Friday uh, chatting with John Champion, Norman C. Leo, and Robert Sawyer. Talk us through that panel. Uh, yeah, we, we did a panel, uh, How Far Is Too Far? Uh, and it was basically an, an interesting kind of a deep dive into the idea that uh, for fans, for viewers, for audience members, at what point did, did Star Trek cross a line that you could no longer uh, tolerate, you could no longer accept? At what point did you feel, oh, they did something that just made no sense or just really ran and rubbed you to the wrong way? And then how did you get past that as, as a viewer? Um, and so we all talked about our own experiences as, as Star Trek uh, consumers and then also uh, took a lot of questions from the audience about that as well. And it turned into a really interesting discussion about the nature of Star Trek, Roddenberry's vision as contrasted with the other showrunners vision and how those two things have, have when those have worked and when that hasn't worked. It is an interesting topic. It's certainly one uh, that, that I've thought about over the time as well. Obviously with our new track with Alex Kurtzman and Secret Hideout running uh, steering the ship now and the many iterations that we have uh, on the air, on the new air uh, as it were. What for you has sort of been, ha has there been a moment for you uh, with, with this current slate of Trek production? Um, there, there, uh, there, there isn't anything within the production itself, I feel, that has uh, driven me to a point where I said, oh, this is no longer Star Trek. But there's certainly a lot of people who, who feel that way. One of the things that I talked about a lot on the panel was, is I actually like the fact that the more modern showrunners, may, may Gene Roddenberry rest in peace, but since he's passed, the showrunners have, uh, particularly on Deep Space Nine and the modern shows, um, not depicted as perfect of a utopian future as Roddenberry did, at least in the early seasons of Next Gen. And we discussed whether that was a positive or negative. I think it's a positive because I think it helps us as people uh, see our own selves and the people that we interact with represented on screen. We see the culture that we're in represented there. There's people with conflict with each other, people who, not necessarily good guys versus bad guys, but people who are genuinely trying to do the right thing, people who want to make the morally right choice, but who may have different opinions of, about what that choice is because they have different backgrounds. And I feel that the later episodes of Next Gen, particularly Deep Space Nine and the modern Trek shows, have reflected that reality a lot better. And that, I think, as a society, helps draw a roadmap of how to get to a better future rather than simply depicting a picture of a better future and say, go there. 
because that doesn't necessarily help us get there. So for me, I'm, I'm, I'm all for uh, the way they're doing it now. And I think they've also done it in a way uh, that doesn't feel like a massive change, a jumping of the shark moment or anything like that. We've kind of taken the history of Star Trek into a path where it kind of naturally was going to go. Uh, whether it would have gone there with, with uh, Jean's uh, guidance, uh, I don't think so. But... Uh, you know, we would have stayed in that utopia and stayed quite flat. But we've got those bumps going on. And I think also, too, that uh, this whole timeline developed where the Federation was actually uh, in conflict, going from conflict to conflict uh, over all these years. And we had that at the end of Season 1 with the Romulans and the Cold War. And, you know, we brought in the Cardassians and had all that sort of stuff as well. So uh, I, I wonder a little bit, too, whether modern Star Trek has had to be a little bit more uh, blunt with its messaging, uh, Star Trek always has been, and I hate the word, but it's been woke uh, the whole time it's been around, but I think now it's had to be a little bit more blunt uh, to, to get the message across. Yeah, absolutely. It's not the 60s and it's not the 80s and 90s. Things are different now. Um, so they're taking a different tact. Um, and we'll see, we'll see how that tracks over time, over the decades to come. It was really interesting to chat with Andy Richardson, uh, Jean Kuhn's uh, assistant from back in the 60s, back in the original start of Star Trek. She mentioned to me that, uh, you know, Star Trek was always very inclusive um, and, and diverse, uh, both cast and crew. Yes. Uh, I think it's something that it's a little bit forgotten uh, that that uh, that it's been there. I wonder what's changed and whether how people have forgotten uh, these elements of uh, early Star Trek. Yeah, it, it it certainly seems like people have, and 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 as you said, I don't I don't know why, and I don't quite understand that. Um, but uh, Star Trek has always been diverse. It's always been inclusive. It's always been representative. So uh, I think the new shows are just continuing in that tradition. I don't think it's a change of direction at all. I, I just love. I'm just. I, I watching the background uh, behind you we've got uh, Starfleet officers with batleths uh, wandering around uh, it's it is the end of the convention uh, it is yeah. Sunday afternoon as we record but um, an incredible time Star Trek is alive and well and we have new Trek on the air as well the first episode of uh, Lower Decks season three at the start of uh, the convention so very very exciting stuff James I really appreciate a little bit of your time thanks for being here absolutely thank you for having me thank you for having me 